Unfiltered. I am your host, Amanda McCross. I'm here with Vanessa Conlin and uh, a fellow neighbor, friend, colleague of ours on the podcast as the very first winemaker guest. How exciting is this? Super exciting. And one of my absolute favorite people. So yes, it's, well, I think yes. we've, <laughs> I think we've made that abundantly clear over the last thirty some episodes in which we've talked about Dan probably at least in every one. It's a uh, lot, at least once. <laughs> one might say excessive, but it's deserved. So <laughs> it's, it's not excessive. It's totally deserved. Welcome to the show, yeah. Dan Petrosky, founder, owner, winemaker of Massacan, the Napa Valley's only white wine only winery, uh, and the king of all things white wine. How are you? Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm I'm the of all the podcasts and all of the wine access relationships. I'm the first wine maker wine maker on the pod. Yes, we we yes. actually awesome. should have made a, <laughs> an intentional decision uh, to not bring winemakers on at the, at this current moment, uh, so we could talk mm -hmm. to some other people. But you know, I think given the the what we're going to be talking about in this episode, it made yeah. sense to have a winemaker on, and given the fact that you've been such a an important cast member unknowingly during the course of this podcast, it made extra sense to have it be you. So congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I'm <laughs> excited to be here and see you guys. Unfortunately, I'm not in Napa Valley. I'm, I just arrived in a hotel in Portland. So bear with my connectivity. Hopefully it's uh, it's spot on as we get through this uh, chat today. You're going to be great. You're a working winemaker. You're up in Portland. I actually haven't asked you what you're doing up there, but maybe you'll share with that uh, share that with us later. So you're here because we're talking about something that I, I'm hoping is going to be sort of an ongoing series, which is winemaking techniques. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because when I moved to Napa Valley, and I'm sure, Vanessa, you've experienced this too, and maybe even, even you, Dan, when I moved to Napa Valley, it was fresh out of New York where you learn lots of things in books. You learn like malolactic fermentation and what oak does to a wine and you hear all this terminology and then you see it in action when you get here and all of a sudden things start to come into focus. You start to see what the multiple pathways are, how those different techniques can influence the actual wine. And I think maybe the most important thing is why those decisions are made. So we're going to be focusing mostly on Chardonnay today. And of course, if there's other grapes that we want to trickle in, we'll allow them. But my hope is that eventually this will be a series where we talk about lots of different grapes and all the different pathways that one can take when making wine and what those pathways ultimately create in the bottle for you at home drinking the juice. So that's why you're here today. Vanessa, do you, did you experience that too when you moved here? Because I feel like that's a pretty common thing for wine professionals to experience. That's literally why I moved here. Was because <laughs> no, no, for real. It's because I wanted to be, you know, I, yeah, I I'd, I'd worked in many parts of the wine business, but um, I had never been around, well, A, vineyards or B, production. Um, so that's, that, you know, was prompted to move out here. And um, so, yeah, absolutely seeing it firsthand, being able to ask questions of the people who are actually making wine, you know, in real time sometimes. And then I'll say also, you know, Dan, just to keep piling the praise on, um, was really helpful to me when I was studying, um, particularly for the theory exam for the for the Master of Wine, because they want a lot of um, real life examples. And so, you know, they don't want you to be quoting things you just read in a book. They want to say, like, you know, Dan Petrosky of Massacan does X, Y and Z during his production to kind of prove your argument. Um, and he was very, very generous with his time and his knowledge. So thank you for that. Well, I hope I can uh, continue to share some more today. I'm sure that you'll share lots of things. I'm really excited for this. I think this is, this, these are questions that I get a lot, right? Why mm -hmm. is, why does Chardonnay sometimes taste like oak and vanilla and butter? And why does it sometimes not? Why is it crispy and minerally? And so this is, I think, a good place to start because Chardonnay is known as the winemaker's grape. So there, I think there's a lot that you can do to play with it. Whether you choose to access some of those different techniques is, of course, a choice that's to be made. And we'll sort of dive into what those are and why you might do them. But before we go any further, we have to start with our cultural events yes. happening in the wine world, of which there are many. It's a good day for canned wine, Vanessa. <laughs> Congratulations to Canned Wine. They're having a moment. They've actually been yeah. they've been having a moment for a while. Leading Canned Wine Company, Archer Roos. This I'm sure you've seen movies with Elizabeth Banks. What's Pitch what's Perfect? The really Pitch Oh yeah, Pitch Perfect. I always forget about that one. Pitch Perfect. She's great as that as a commentator. Um the one I was thinking of was 40-year-old Virgin where she like she's the one that gets sick in the car, right? Oh, I, I forgot so. she was in that. I I just <laughs> like I one of my favorite her. cameos ever. I love yeah. her. Yeah. 
anyway, amazing, amazing comedic actress or just actress who does a lot of comedies. Uh, but Elizabeth Banks is partnered in this canned wine company called Archer Roos. They just announced their expansion of a partnership with JetBlue in which they will do a wine takeover of all the wines served in the airline's core cabin throughout its network, which I think is a really interesting step uh, in a modern direction. You know, I, I think it was a couple years ago that they announced a partnership with a, a wine company in New York in which all of the mint service got a, a really nice upgrade on the wine. Yeah. But now it's nice to see that they're really paying attention to the core cab. And my only question is, what do y'all think of it being canned wine? Is this a step in the right direction, a step in the modern direction? How do we feel? I have no issue with it. Perfect. Per, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think, um, I don't know why they made the decision that it was all going to be canned. I imagine perhaps from a transportation, it's, maybe mm. it's easier on the, I don't know, to, to, to bottle what maybe it's lighter. I don't know, Dan, do you, do you have any ideas on that? Uh, Vanessa, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think this is a logistics and a, uh, play on their part. I mean, these are serving single, single servings that can be given to guests on the plane. You don't need to be pulling off a cork or a capsule or a screw cap and cans are lighter. They take up less space uh, for recyclability, for trash on the airline. So I think it's a, it's a major play in the right direction for the airline. And, um, and I know the Archer Roos wines have had them before. They're actually quite good. Um, and they're made to drink young and fresh and now most canned wine should be. Yeah, agreed. I think, um, I think canned wine is definitely headed in the right direction. I've had some really great examples of it. Uh, of course, Sans wine cans here in Napa Valley, you know, one of the, the pioneers of great quality canned wine in the early stages. I've been loving Nomadica lately. I haven't mm -hmm. had much experience with Archer Roos, but I love, to your point, Dan, the freshness that they sort of focus on. So a lot of like chillable reds, Friulian whites, um, which of course is right in your wheelhouse. So I think it's great. And I think also like how many times have we been on flights with like garbage wine? You know, it comes in those like crappy bottles or it comes in like the really big like Sutter home giant looking bottles and you're like that can't be good uh and then it you know it gets poured in a plastic cup and you're like awesome I just spent eight dollars on a glass of wine that I'm definitely gonna get a headache from so this is why I'm almost exclusively a vodka soda gal on the plane <laughs> <laughs> yeah I respect that I yeah. respect that what about you Dan what do you drink on a plane um, when I was traveling a lot pre pandemic for work related reasons, and I was uh, entertaining a lot eating and drinking and doing the wine thing, I used to play in as a kind of uh, as like rehab, you know, not I didn't drink anything. <laughs> I was like, water and cranberry juice, water and cranberry juice, just keep filling it up. Um, so I'm not a I'm not a plain drinker. Uh, unfortunately, maybe one day I'll get to that situation in life where I could. Uh, I can imbibe a little uh, more luxuriously on a plane. What if they brought out like grower champagne for you? Would you do you think you could break for that? Oh, for sure. And yeah. then get like a little like cheese its or something to go with it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. If they just like all of a sudden they're like, here's some Pierre Peters. Enjoy. Yeah. For, yeah for no, sure. I think I think it's an extra step in a good, good direction. <laughs> but yeah, congratulations to Archer Ruse. That's awesome. I love I love hearing about that. Um, I love anything that gets wine into people's glasses or mouths or whatever. So well done. Y'all, um, let's move on to something that I think, Vanessa, you could probably speak to, which is the Michelin Guide and Wine Access. What is happening here? Because every time I, I open my Instagram, <laughs> there's like more food porn and wine porn and like famous people dining. And uh, the Michelin Guide just published this article that, uh, about this Michelin Wine Access dinner at 11 Medicine Park. I don't know if you attended that, but I know you were just there having dinner there. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris and David Berker were in attendance. Nikki Hilton Rothschild, Olivia Palermo. Um, they all drank great wine and had looked like they had a lot of fun. Um, were you there for it? What's going on with this partnership? I was there, yes. <gasps> um, yeah, so... The so wine access and the Michelin Guide uh, we're the official wine partner of the Michelin Guide. So as part of that partnership, there's a couple different things we do. Um, we sponsor a Sommelier of the Year award for the different markets when they're giving out their stars. So I just got back last night actually from Los Angeles because they had the California star reveals, and um, I gave out the award there. But we do that in various markets. But we also have um, a, a club or a subscription that we do where it's five shipments a year, four bottles each 
shipment focuses on a different Michelin restaurant. I, I I'm frankly, and obviously I'm very close to it. So, uh, but I think it's the coolest thing ever. I don't think there's anything else like this out there where, you know, you'll get four bottles shipped to you. that kind of showcases the ethos of that wine director, you know, wine access sources them and facilitates all the shipments and all that. Um, but you get, you know, quotes from the sommelier, from the chef, pairings, et cetera. And our most recent shipment was in collaboration with 11 Madison Park, which was especially cool to put together because they are all plant-based now, you know? Um, right. They went plant-based. They kept their three stars after that. I think Chef Hume was extremely surprised, <laughs> actually, yeah. that 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 he kept his stars because that was a pretty bold move. But, um, but yeah, so so we, we invited some, you know, notable New York folks. We opened the wines. We had some food. We celebrated the partnership. And um, here we are. So very, very cool evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what you had meant to say earlier, not to correct you, but you had said it's like one of the coolest wine clubs out there. Like, I think you mm -hmm. meant to say the second coolest. because we The second coolest. Obviously. Wine club. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to clarify that for everyone good, listening. Good, good point, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, the Michelin Guide Wine Club is very cool. Uh, I, I actually remember when you guys announced it like a little over a year ago and I, mm -hmm. I, I was pumped about that because it's been some great, yeah. you guys have done some great partnerships and, you know, frankly, I feel like, you know, to some degree, I've been the beneficiary of said partnership because I've gotten yeah. to go to some of these. Yes. Dinners. And I can't reveal what the next uh, partner restaurant will be, but I will say that it's one that has made a lot of news very recently and we're very excited about it. So Ooh. To, be, to be continued, but just, couldn't just be more dangling thrilled. Dangling the dangling the treat the treats in the oven. I love it. Yeah. It's good. All right. <laughs> I look forward to it. That's very cool. And I love Madison Park. If, if any of you are not familiar with the three Michelin starred restaurant in New York City, Dan, I assume you've been before, right? Yeah, I was uh, had the good fortune of eating there not in early 2020, um, but I haven't seen it. I haven't been there with uh, it was that when the, it wasn't plant based. Maybe it was 2019 at the time. Yeah, but a phenomenal, phenomenal. Mexican uh, is on uh, the list there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm very, uh, very honored. Very honored. Mexican's on a lot of lists. Just yes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true but we call it you know affectionately call it zombie right <laughs> i think i actually i think i actually had that in my tiktok video that went ultra viral a couple of months ago um yeah i love, I love medicine bark uh that is the restaurant that, that got away from me uh the story that i always like to tell is a few years ago i went on this crazy three three week adventure trying to go to as many of the world's 50 best restaurants as as i could and i the very final stop was supposed to be a Love Medicine Park. And of course, you pay in advance for these reservations, mm -hmm. right? And so we had gone to everywhere into Blue Hills from Barnes. We went to Liberty Den. We had been down in Lima. We had been in Mexico City. And final stop, a Love Medicine Park, right? Very exciting. And that afternoon, uh, my boyfriend came out of the bathroom and he said, I'm, I'm not feeling great. And I was like, what do you mean you're not feeling great? And he's like, I'm not feeling great. And I was like, great, like, you need a cough drop or like, not great, like, I got to cancel. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> so like oh. out of solidarity, I was like, all right, we'll call some friends in New York. They can take the reservation. We'll get there. We'll get back there eventually. Yes. And of course, like that year they had gotten number one on world's 50 best. And, you know, of course got their three stars and then the pandemic and then they went plant-based. I was like, uh, someday it'll happen. But it was, it's the restaurant that got away from me. Eventually I'll go back there. Maybe courtesy of Wine Access. Who knows? Mm. Um, we should go together. We should go together. Let's all three do a field trip to yeah. 11 Medicine Park. I think it'd be great. All right. I think uh, let's, let's talk about one more. You want to talk about fake wine? Let's talk about fake wine. Sure. Fake wine's always a fun topic. 40,000 fake <sighs> Lafitte and Penfolds bottles wines uncovered in Fujian. The coastal province in southern China, this was one of the biggest fake wine busts in history. Uh, a police raid with a value worth over $1.56 million. Wow. First of all, are you familiar with like, you know, I'm sure you're both familiar with the, the whole fake wine in China thing, right? Yes. I, I just want to know like what was actually in the bottle. I, oh my God, I had the same question. I yeah, had the exact right? same. I was like, what did they put in there? That's a lot of wine. That's a lot of wine. <laughs> Where did you get it? Yeah. And then you have to wonder too, like, were they worried that if people opened it, that, that they would be found out? So were they trying to make it like at least good quality in the bottle? Or did they think people were just going to buy it as a showpiece and not open it? I have, I have a lot of questions, to be honest. I have so many questions. And I think like if, 
one of my favorite accounts to follow if you're not following it is fake wine in China on Instagram. It's aggregated oh, photos from this like fake wine in China WeChat. It's so good. So if you want to see what any of these bottles okay. look like, which by the way, we're not talking about like Rudy Kunerwan level fraud. Like we're talking about really bad fraud wines. Like like they kind of take like a resembling DRC logo or like Penfolds logo and they put like these crazy things in the bottles, but like I mean, it definitely doesn't look real. Like they're not and doing like, it. Like they're not fooling me or you. And miss they misspell the name of the winery, right? Yes. Often. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, it's good. It's a good account to follow. <sighs> I had the same question. I wanted to know what was inside the wines. The crazy part is like these are being sold in stores, right? This isn't like some underground like black market. Like they actually go out into distribution and go to stores. Wow. So like you could feasibly walk into a wine shop in China and pick one of these up off the shelf. No, I, I think the um, the interesting thing here, like, like you mentioned Rudy, Amanda, is that a lot of the old wines that he was faking, he was taking, you know, younger wines, not, ter- mm-hmm. not present modern day wines. And to think about like every wine he poured was actually tasted good because he tasted it in advance. So he was literally like double yeah. decanting the wine. Yeah. So a lot of people who um, who got caught on uh, on his chain they thought these the wines in their cellar were fantastic. Like their sixty one, <laughs> their sixty one Bordeaux tasted like nineteen ninety Cabernet from Napa. Yeah. You know, it's like wow, this is amazing. This one, um, better than Kim Kardashian. This is great. It is. <laughs> so I, I do think that there's a lot of people who uh, who don't understand that like real old wine and how a lot of old wine kind of goes down a pathway of of yeah. not tasting great all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. No, it's a, that's and, a great that's a great point. And Lafitte's not. I mean, Lafitte's not an everyday person's drinking wine so you add a little bit of fruit to that a little bit of you know pick me up and i think that's uh you know i could see you know a million dollars worth of juicy lafitte being sold in the marketplace totally no i i think that's i i never thought about it that way but yes i mean i don't know if they're trying to sell current vintage or old vintage or like what the heck's happening but either way uh the the wine is off the shelves I do want to know what happens to these bottles. I've heard that they get destroyed, but like, I would also like to see that process. So if a TikTok video could be made watching the destruction of 40,000 bottles of wine, I would also like to see that, which feels like a giant waste to me, but who knows if the wine was good in the first place. We're going to wrap it up on cultural events there, unless unless we want to just mention really quick that Spring Mountain Vineyards is potentially going to be sold. And this has been in the works for like a very long time. When I say in the works, like This is an interesting article that I encourage you to read on your own and to dive into on your own if you're at all into finance, because this is a classic like loan to own situation where like they got massively over leveraged. You know, I think in part because of the fires, uh, they had like $35 million worth of damage that happened. They were significantly impacted in the 2020 fires. They had just done major ramp, major replants. So it's kind of a bummer, but I, Stan, have you been to that property? And I'm sure Vanessa, you have. I have, I, to your point, I think this was, I I remember, I think I heard about this property being up for sale. Like feels like five years ago, at least it feels like people are talking about this for a long, long time, but, but yeah, I, I read that same article and to your point, it's really, it's, yeah, there's a lot of, <laughs> it's a very financial article and it shows a lot of kind of behind the scenes, what things cost and how these things happen in, in the wine business. Dan, have you been paying attention to it at all? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's one of the iconic wineries of Napa Valley I mean, uh, mm-hmm. for flavor, for style, for Spring Mountain in general, kind of almost mm-hmm. put it on, a, put Spring Mountain on the map by itself, uh, the, the appellation of Spring Mountain. But, um, and they also, they also have, a, they had their own Chardonnay clone as we kind of transition into this next conversation. Um, oh. They were famous for, yeah, like they're just that. like Stony Hill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everyone kind of took, uh, everyone took the Wenty, you know, the Wenty Chardonnay clones and, and Dr. Harold Omo did a lot of work to kind of clean them up to get rid mm. of those quote unquote, those little shot berries that we'll talk about. And, um, and it's kind of just, that's how Chardonnay kind of populated in the sixties throughout the Napa Valley and Sonoma County was, uh, you know, cleaning up all the all the kind of disease that, that uh, the original Wenty clones had. But, uh, but yeah, Spring Mountain was one of the uh, early days of, uh, uh, of Chardonnay. Really great. Interesting. Hmm. I did not know that. Dan Petrowski, bring either. you the knowledge. Not Why that I'm, Not that I'm surprised. All right. <laughs> Speaking of knowledge, if you are enjoying all the knowledge that we are giving to you on a bi-weekly basis, whether here on the listening format or on YouTube, which is, by the way, where we put all of the video content, do us a favor and like, subscribe, review this podcast. Reviews are wonderful and they really help other people to find this podcast. And 
sometimes we re- we read the reviews because we love them so much. So this yes. week's review is from Live Empowered, who said, love this podcast. Amanda and Vanessa, exclamation point. Amanda and Vanessa are the best hosts and so much fun to listen to. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. We are so appreciative of that. It, it really means a lot that you not only take the time to listen to this podcast, but also that you took the time to review. So we really appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, this, this podcast is available in full video format on YouTube. We have our very own channel and I also put a lot of content out on Instagram. So if you want to hang out with us there, we put some fun clips up, some things that we mention. Um, You know, we talk about a lot of stuff in this podcast. So I put a lot of stuff up on the Instagram. The wine club as well, if you're not joined into the Wine Access Unfiltered Wine Club, we have so much fun, Vanessa Vanessa and I on our Slack channel and tasting, trying to figure out what we're going to do for each episode and for the, these these shipments that come out every two months. So it's four bottles you can join and then one bottle from each episode will be featured in your shipment. So all the links are in the description below. I encourage you to join. We're having a lot of fun. And the wines honestly just keep getting better and I'm very excited for the one that we have today. So without any further ado, let's jump into the winemaking techniques focusing on Chardonnay in three, two, one, let's go. The wine club wine, if you are in the wine club and want to join us, is what I'm going to refer to as a VC special. This is the yeah. Grand Sonnery Chardonnay. Uh, actually, before we get in, Vanessa, since this is like your baby, this is a this is an extra VC special because this is not only a wine that you found, but this is like a wine that you sort of collaborated on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a collaboration with Luke Morlay, a uh, winemaker. You may know him from his own wines, uh, Morlay, but also of uh, Peter Michael. Um, and yes, so we worked on this, um, the Grand Sonnery, this, this label has a couple different bottlings underneath it. We have a Napa Cab, we have a, um, a St. Helena and an Oakville. And then we added the Chardonnay, which is from Coombsville. So he knew of the site. Uh, he found the site. We tasted some wines that had been made from it and then decided it would be really great to add this to the, to the lineup. So pretty small production, but it is in the shipment, as you mentioned, Amanda and Grand Sonnery, just to take a moment, you sort of held up the bottle, um, to show, but, it, um, it's actually a wild watchmaking term so Hmm. it's it's that has to do with like the sound and the striking and it's very rare and hard to achieve so to achieve a grand sonnery is sort of the ultimate sign of like a um, master watchmaker in the industry so we and we thought it'd be a great kind of collaboration with luke because of course he's a quite accomplished winemaker so there you go yeah he's done some things uh awesome i actually i'm loving this already this is like this, first of all, it's at the perfect temperature, as we've talked about before with Chardonnay, and especially a fuller bodied, slightly more rich style of Chardonnay, mm-hmm. which this is. Um, not serving it too cold, really allowing some of those textural elements to kind of come through. I've got this in a burgundy glass right now. Uh, so that is the ideal glass whenever you're drinking Chardonnay, burgundy glass. But I don't think any of us have the same style of glass because I think, Dan, nope. uh, you've got a you got a fun tumbler in front of you. Is that what's happening? Yes, I have <laughs> This is my my hotel glassware. No, but I was super excited when I found out this wine, we'd be tasting this wine today because uh, I too am inspired by Luke. I mean, Luke is, a, he's been a, a Napa Valley icon, a legend in winemaking. And he, you know, I, when I drink this wine, when I smell this wine, I could just see his little, you know, smiling face, you know, it's just like <laughs> Luke. Um, and that just, that's, that You're just so brings smiling. me pure, that just, you know, Google search him, you'll see his big smile. And it's just like, um, it's just really, it just brings me joy to kind of get into this wine. And, and we can Aww. talk a little bit about, you know, Chardonnay and Napa Valley as well, because I, this is a Coombsville Chardonnay, yes. um, a kind of up and coming region of the Napa Valley for Coombsville sounds kind of cool, you know, and it is a little slightly cooler climate down there. Well, let's talk about Chardonnay as a grape, because, you know, all, obviously all three of us have experience with Chardonnay, which can be made into anything from a still wine, which is what we're having today dessert wine. Uh, I mean, I've, I've definitely had some late harvest Chardonnays that still have a little bit of residual sugar. And of course, Vanessa's favorite, my favorite, I'm sure Dan's favorite to some degree, champagne or sparkling wine. So Chardonnay can be turned into a multitude of different beverages that are not just still wines. Uh, and I think we should just open with not all Chardonnay is oaky and buttery. <laughs> I think yes. it's an important thing to say, right? Because so important. 
even though we've talked about it to to no end, uh, it's still, you know, I still hear out there like, well, I don't like Chardonnay because it's oaky and buttery. And we're going to talk about why not all Chardonnay is oaky and buttery. But I want to start with sort of the principles of what Chardonnay is. And I think, Dan, you'd be a pr- great person to kick this off with like, what is Chardonnay at its core? What are some of the the components of that grape that you think are 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 consistent across uh, terroir across winemaking styles. What what do you love? What do you hate about Chardonnay? Well, for, first and foremost, the history of Chardonnay it comes from one of the most common grape varieties. Like they jokingly say that the the parent of Chardonnay that that came together with Pinot Noir, I can't even pronounce the name, was just like yellow water. Like it was like <laughs> drinking yellow water. It wasn't even. It, it had no flavor. So Chardonnay as yeah. a parent, its parent wasn't. It came wasn't very noble. Uh, but it also did, you know, mate with uh, with Pinot Noir, and this is a this is not only a Chardonnay conversation, in my opinion. When you talk about the the DNA, the characteristic of a, of uh, a white grape, um, I think about Sauvignon Blanc. I think about Chardonnay. I think about like their soul, and I think of their um, their 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 throughput as a finished wine is all in the juice. When you're dealing with terroir, you're dealing with the soil, and you're dealing with the climactic conditions. Well. A lot of the climactic conditions have to impact the, the, the formation of the skins and the coloring of the skins in red wine. So when you're dealing with the white wine grape, a thin-skinned white wine grape, you're not really bringing in the climactic conditions so much. You're actually absorbing the, the soils. So, there, so the 50% of your finished wine is usually the pure DNA of, of the grape variety, so Chardonnay DNA, and then then the soil the mm. soil terroir that brings in, you know, start, and then there's also the you got to add the Yogi Berra, you know, the extra 10% for uh, for the style of the winemaker making choices based on their regionality. So I think about Chardonnay, I, I agree with you, I love it, because it can do so many things in a high production side, it can become juicy and flavorful and and still retains acidity, but maybe not get to the uh, kind of the, the premier crew or the, the level of Luke's wine that we're drinking with style and richness and luxury. Um, and that's where it became really important in sparkling winemaking. And that's why Napa Valley is full of sparkling wineries. We have from Schramsberg to Mum to Chandon to uh, Domaine Carneros. And that's the majority of the Chardonnay production today coming out of uh, Napa and Napa Carneros is because of those sparkling wine productions. Because they also started back, you know, I can get on a tangent here with history, but <laughs> but the historical, the historical basis of the farmers in, in California were yield. It wasn't about quality. It was yeah. about we want six, eight tons an acre, and right. Chardonnay at that level is a different grape than Chardonnay at maybe at you know at that what we're seeing in Chablis and the bottling that we're going to taste, and also mm-hmm. the Grand Chenier, where the yields could be two to three tons an acre, and you can see it, di- and that alone is how the plant reacts with six tons an acre versus how the plant reacts with two tons an acre yeah. is very different. It'll take the same grape in two different years and make it go in two different directions stylistically. Right. I can't just sum up your question, Amanda, with a simple answer because it is one of the most complex and that's why one of the most uh, increasingly um, you know, enjoyed grape varieties and planted all over the world. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think that like sort of sets us off into the path that I want to go on, which is what are these paths that you can take, right? So you're a winemaker here in Napa Valley. You focus solely on white wine right now. And Chardonnay is one of those grapes. So when you start the process of making a Chardonnay, and you can make a Chardonnay that's very lean and crispy and minerally, you can make a Chardonnay that's very rich and round and elegant. At what point in your journey do you make that decision? Is it early? Is it late? And walk me through the steps of how you might approach going down whatever path you do decide to choose. When I first started working with Chardonnay um, for my brand, Masakan, in 2009, I used Chardonnay as almost like glue, almost like filler. Hmm. I, used to always, I used to always joke that... Because um, you were blending it. I was blending it. I was okay. blending it with uh, my Anya wine, which is, has historically been a, a blend of Tokai, Friulano, Ribola, Jala, and Chardonnay. I used to say that Tokai, Friulano was the roof of it's the high toned aromatics of the wine where bola jala was the floor it was kind of that kind of earthy savory part of the wine and chardonnay was the window dressing it actually pulled it all mm. it pulled the house together because i needed a, i needed something that was familiar to the american palate to kind of come through and say okay when, and chardonnay can be that beautiful blender and be this commoner but also just fill in all the details of uh, of the painting 
Um, and that's kind of how I used Chardonnay early on. And um, I happened to be using a Carneros vineyard um, planted by Larry Hyde, very famous vineyard in Napa. So cool, yeah. And I, at, after years of doing that, I finally, you know, got the guts to ask them if I could make a, a single vineyard designation of their Chardonnay because I started to enjoy the 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 representation of wine that was coming into the Masakan portfolio, which was this Carneros, a little bit higher yielding little bit kind of more citrus side, more stone fruit side than you would get um, on a lower yielding kind of richer, more um, tropical uh, version of it. And uh, and they said yes. And then so I've been bottling a 100% Hyde Vineyard since 2014 in very, very low quantities. Um, but it's a, it's a wine that is very floral, very orchard fruity, and a little bit of citrus as well. And that is because that vineyard does really well at five tons an acre. And... Mm. People, winemakers don't like to talk about that. They want to talk about low yields yeah. and intensity of flavor and power and richness. Um, well, Hyde is, uh, is the mother of all high yielding vineyards, just like Tokolone is if, um, from the red grape side. And so you're sort of letting that dictate the trajectory of your wine or did you, did you have a style of wine in mind even before that? Because, you know, we've got, we've got two different styles of Chardonnay in front of us. One, you know, Chablis, Minerally, Lean, Crisp, another one you know, sort of on the opposite side of that, which, you know, I think is amazing about Chardonnay that you can have a, a wide spectrum of different choices. But as a winemaker, I suspect that is a little bit overwhelming to some degree to sort of figure out what that grape wants to do. So when are you making that decision and how is that being informed? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is a, is a self-consciousness at first because um, all winemakers in Napa and Sonoma, and that's who I can speak of because that's who you know, my friend said is, we'll all like, whenever we hear another winemaker say, I'm making my Pinot Noir in the style of Burgundy or my Chardonnay in the style of Chablis or my Cabernet in the style of Bordeaux, we just all cringe. Even though yeah. those <laughs> words have come out of our mouth so many fucking times, yeah. um, we still we still just cringe, right? And so we want to set our own path. And I think what what California does really well, and especially Carneros, where uh, Coombsville is not very far from Carneros and, and, and Luke's wine, um, what California does well is it provides this added sunshine that, you know, mm -hmm. definitely the Burgundy, that this kind of intercontinental Burgundy landscape it, you know, has a whole different set of, uh, uh, of climactic conditions. But California does sunshine really well, even in its coolest parts like the Sonoma Coast, even in Carneros, and even as we get down south into Santa Barbara County. So I truly love that we have this ability to be as more flexible than mm. probably any other region in the world to how we want to bring Chardonnay to life for the style of our our own passion, but also the passion of our our, our drinkers, people who who follow and buy our wines. So let's talk about that a little bit because I think I think climate and terroir is such an important part of this conversation. And you just mentioned California, you know, no no lack of sunshine, right? Like we're not dying for sunny days in July and August. So what happened, like when you make that decision to pick, right, let's talk about the two different pathways. Like if you were to pick your Chardonnay in August, right? So on the earlier side, you pick like, let's say between August 15th and August 30th. Like I, would you consider that on the early-ish side? Oh yes, for sure. Okay. So if you were to pick through, through that period versus picking later into September, what do those two pathways look like for Chardonnay? What are some of the results of that picking decision? Well, California is interesting. Um, if you're a traditional Sonoma or just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay producer, Chardonnay always ripens after Pinot. Mm. Chardonnay will, will bud out earlier at times, but then have a longer hang time. Um, I've never picked as early as August, April, August 15th, but I've picked as early as August 20th. And uh, mm. this past year, a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues and peers picking on the earlier side. But without the, I mean, again, you can be at that, um, at those date ranges without, um, while still maintaining a richness level or a sugar level that will return a richness level in your wine that you're looking for stylistically. Um, yield is a bit, you know, so yield and temperature is a really big, play a really big role in Chardonnay style. So uh, that is something that is the, the larger the yield, the hotter the temperature, you can still maintain freshness. The larger the yield, the cooler the temperature, you, you're making sparkling wine, basically. Um, you're making razor blades. And, and then as you yeah. get lower yield, hotter temperatures, you're making a bigger, richer, bolder style. Chardonnay does really well holding on to its, uh, 
holding on to its acidity, even as we convert yeah. the malic acid, which is a, a you know a term that came up earlier, um, and we convert that to lactic acids. Chardonnay still has a sense of freshness. There's in Luke's wine, there is no lack of freshness in that mm-hmm. wine. It's mm-hmm. it's vibrant. It has energy, <clears throat> and um, and that was in 2019 was you know cool vintage. Started off really wet and rainy. The vines had a lot of water, and that just allowed them to be very vigorous. And then produce a lot of fruit, but also a very warm sum, summer to draw everything down. So it was like one of the perfect conditions for for a wine. So um, 2019 Chardonnays, this one in particular, really good. I agree with you about the freshness of the Grand Sonnery. Um, Even though there is, there's like, when I was, blind, let's say I was blind tasting a flight of, of Chardonnays or something. You know, there's something about that California sunshine where even if there's like really, really high mouthwatering acidity, there's almost like, I, w- I call it the California stuffing. There's like a richness at the mid palate, right? That um, at the, at its core that just kind of can't be replicated. But, um, you know, you're talking about malic acid or, or we're talking about malolactic fermentation. What I think is interesting, especially tasting this side by side is the Chablis, for instance, is 100% goes 100% malolactic fermentation, right? But it's so, it is almost still like a razor blade. Um, and when I was um, earlier in my kind of studying wine career and I went to Chablis for the first time and I just had always assumed because the acid is so high, it's so racy that the wines didn't go, sometimes didn't go through mallow. And I asked a winemaker, I was like, oh, how do you decide whether to let it? And he basically like laughed at me, you know, in a good spirited way, but he's like, all Chablis goes through 100% malolactic, all of it, because it, if you didn't, it would literally like take the enamel off of your teeth, but you don't notice it. You know, this goes back to what you were talking about at the very beginning, Amanda, right? Like this is not a buttery Chardonnay, yeah. but, but it still went through the same process as uh, the Grand Sonnery, which I say you do get, you do get a butteriness to that wine. Yeah. I, and I think, I think um, it's important that we sort of illuminate what malolactic fermentation, fermentation is or conversion is. For anyone that's listening, that's like, what are these words? What does this mean? So, <laughs> yeah. so malolactic fermentation or malolactic conversion, as sometimes it's now called, is this conversion of the very tart angular malic acid to lactic acid. And it's sort of the result of that is this creamy, buttery, uh, you know, it's this compound called diacetyl that that results out of this. Um, it's a natural thing that happens. It will happen on its own. And correct me if I'm, if I'm saying anything wrong, but... Um, when a Chardonnay, you know, a lot of white wines are allowed to go through malolactic fermentation, uh, certainly Chardonnay. When that happens, you do sort of get this like creamy richness. But Dan, do you, would you, do you subscribe to what the Burgundian winemakers in Chablis are saying? Like all Chardonnay, you know, should go through malolactic or have there been times when you're like, I choose not to do that? Because there's certainly winemakers that have blocked malolactic fermentation to retain more of that zigzaggy malic acid feel oh for sure and and and, and vanessa's 100 percent right um i don't want to we don't want to say our opinion is fact and that every single wine in burgundy do it do it wine <laughs> <laughs> um every single burgundy and chardonnay is uh, doesn't go through ml but um you also have to look at the starting points of their malolactic fermentation right so they might be their grape wines might actually be heavier uh, heavier tartaric acid. That's what builds this acid in the wine. It's the malic and the tartaric. The tartaric remains, um, and it's that malic. And just you know, Amanda, you did a great job of like giving the you know the textbook definition. You said earlier in this podcast, you you know, you come from New York and you read more than you drank about wine yeah. to learn. <laughs> and um, and that mal- and and yes, but there are there malic acid. It really depends on the the site, right? So, and I can I'll use a kind of example again because I work with it. But it's like that's a vineyard that won't go through malic uh, conversion because it doesn't have malic is just is is microbial, and it needs its fermentation. So it's this microbial fermentation that ter- converts the the crispy green apple to you know those lacticy milky characters, and the vineyard doesn't have that. It has a very low rooting system. Doesn't have the microbial um, uh, ability to kind of convert its malic acid to lactic acid, unless unless you drive it down. Unless you, when I mean driving it down, is the longer you hang the grapes to a higher sugar level, your acidities continue to decrease in the in the actual physical grapes. So when you are making the wine, you don't have much there to begin with, so you don't need 
a lot of microbial activity to do it. You can inoculate for uh, to, to convert it, but um, when these wines are coming in the cellar at 3.1, 3.2 pH, which is very acidic, it's really difficult for, it's not a happy condition for microbial activity to kind of produce a, a secondary fermentation. But the French Chardonnays that we drink, even these Chablis, they're, they're not wickedly acidic in like the 3.0, 3.1, even though they taste that way, they still have a 3.3, 3, 4 pH. They just have um, the, the, the yield and the, and the climate and you know, the, the, the soil to kind of bring out these kind of stony notes to the wine that, are, that I feel like, like citrus rubbed on stone. All right. So choice number one, you decide when to pick, right? Mm -hmm. Based on, you know, your preference as a winemaker, based on yields, based on lots of different things. And so that picking decision, you know, you're, you're going to be dealing with what bricks am I harvesting at? And that in turn will result in ripeness or less than ripeness or somewhere in between. Uh, the actual malolactic part of these things, that happens at what stage in the winemaking process, Dan? And are there decisions that you're making between picking and mallow that are important, like pressing or some, something, sulfuring, something else that happens in there? For sure. Um, malactic fermentation is also commonly called secondary fermentation. So it happens after the primary alcohol conversion. So once you convert your, all your alcohol, your sugars to alcohol, then the microbial activity will happen. Alcohol will prevent some of the um, uh, secondary fermentation from happening if you have a really high alcohol wine um, because alcohol is kind of a, a it's very astringent um, and it's a preservative but uh, the secondary fermentation malactic fermentation will happen after that whole process starts uh, after the whole process stops and a lot of times if you were thinking about the good old days when you didn't have controlled fermentation temperatures you didn't have warm rooms cold rooms you know tanks that had glycol jackets and you had a cave or a barn in burgundy and it's now october november december and it's really fucking cold outside and the wine chills down then nothing happens and that's why they always say like you know malic fermentation happens in the spring when the cellar starts to warm up again when it gets out of the low the high 40s and low 50s into the you know mid to high 50s so you'll from for healthy malic fermentation you want it to be a cool fermentation but you also want it to 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 um, you know, be slightly warmer uh, in, in white, you know, in your white wine degrees. So you want it to be in that like 58, 62 range and let it tick away slowly. And what people will say is the longer the malactic fermentation, the more density of, and nuance and complexity of flavor that will come out over time as mm. it's slowly evolving. And I always joke and say, when you get that malactic fermentation, you know, we talked a little bit about you mentioned earlier that Chablis could potentially be made in steel, in stainless steel, and not in oak. But if you're in, if you're, if you're a rich, you know, California Sunshine Chardonnay, you've got good, good potential alcohol because there's a lot of sunshine here, and you convert those those milky, creamy flavors, they extract alcohol is a solvent. It extracts the, the the wood tones from the barrel mm -hmm. so it pulls in that woodiness that toastiness that char and then you add you add in that kind of buttery creamy milky lactic acid and that's like you know beautifully to toasted bread and butter and it's like that's yeah. like the epitome and you then you add these wonderful fruit flavors on top of it from california chardonnay and you just have just a you know a mind-blowing experience we joke about it being too much too rich too too oaky and buttery and popcorny, but at the same time, you know, the number one selling wine in America is still Vintners Reserve, Kendall Jackson, you know, it's like their yep. Chardonnay just yeah. kills it. Which, by the way, I went down there to their production facilities a couple of months ago. I had no idea that those wines were like barrel, like legitimately barrel fermented in like individual barrels, like thousands of them. So you walk oh, into wow. the facility. Yeah. I, I was just assuming I was like, oh, it's probably like fake oak, right? Like they just mix it all in. No, this is individual barrel fermentation huh. happening with like, you know, a yeah. very large percent, a, lar a large production Chardonnay, barrel fermented, barrel aged. There's nothing fake about it. I, Amanda, I had the same reaction when I moved out here and I was working in Sonoma County with Andy Smith at Dumal. Mm. Um, one of my friends in my poker group was, uh, was the white wine maker for La Crema. Mm. And everything at La Crema was made in barrel with batonage. 
Huh. And I was like, are you kidding me? So when my sisters would call me from New Jersey and be like, hey, what should we serve at a dinner party this weekend? I'm like, buy the La Crema Chardonnay. Yes. It's like $18 and it's like made like it's a $100 yeah. wine. Um, so, so funny KJ, the same answer. <laughs> Kendall Jackson, man, they don't they don't cut corners. They, they're popular for the reasons – because they do things well. Yeah, no, I my mind was blown when I was like, this is like a thirteen dollar wine that they're doing barrel fermentation, badinage, <laughs> and like legitimate oak wow. aging. And they, I, I had mean, no idea. Yeah, no, it's it's worth going down to see. Uh, so it kind of blew my mind. But I think you know, I think on that point, like what we're talking about here, oak barrels are not inexpensive. You know, I think Jackson family definitely has the uh, the the resources the scale and the resources <laughs> to um to do a lot of vertical integration within you know the actual like you know making of the barrels and things like that so they have the ability to cut costs in certain places but the fact that that's happening is pretty impressive but i think as a winemaker i think one of the decisions that you have to make is like all right well maybe i do want a richer style but like i can't afford new oak barrels which are very expensive year after year and so there is sort of an economics game to be played when you're working with a grape like chardonnay um has that influenced your decision dan i know that's kind of a personal financial question but like you know how much do finances in impact you making chardonnay well making high chardonnay <laughs> it impacts a lot it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it is it is one of the grand crew vineyards of california yeah. so uh for chardonnay but um but i will say this because you know, Chardonnay in all its forms, if even if it's at 14 or 13.5 to 14% alcohol and you use a new French oak barrel, it's not staying in the barrel for very long. Hmm. So it might be in the barrel for six or nine months. So a lot of the technique here in California is ferment in barrel, age in barrel till pre-harvest. And then this is a very Burgundian thing as well. Then you rack out all of your wines before the harvest for the next vintage and you put them in stainless steel tank and then you bottle them in December or January. So that the wine goes in barrel for nine months and then in tank for three months and then it gets bottled. Well, what that does is it takes this barrel that you've only used for nine months that might have been new. So you actually get this extended impact of barrel impact, extended oak flavor impact, extended oxidative impact over a couple of years. So a second and third used barrel for Chardonnay is it, it doesn't fall off like uh, a red wine, like a Cabernet barrel that you use for two years where it extracts everything out of the barrel. Chardonnay kind of, you can use a, a barrel three times and still get this beautiful hmm. rounded textural um, oak experience from, um, I mean, and white wine barrels are the hardest things to come by in California. Like, you know, I remember working hmm. with Stony Hill for a little bit of making their red wine and and uh, winemaker at the time, Mike Collini brought the, some barrels down to, 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 to kind of put the Cabernet into. And I was like, Mike, what are these barrels? He goes, oh, they're my old Chardonnay barrels. I'm like, when did you buy them? This was in 2009, by the way. He's like, I was like, when did you buy them? He's like, I don't know, 1982? <laughs> it's like, so you, oh white, wine bar white wine barrels can be used over and over and over. So they are the most, um, most effective financial decision you can make is, you know, keeping your white wine barrels in very mm. good shape, healthy, healthy shape, clean shape to continue to make wine in. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, all right. So just to recap, all right, we had our picking decisions, Mel Lackey fermentation. We're talking about oak barrels right now. So we're talking, we're also just to, to clarify, we're talking about French oak barrels. Uh, you know, we're not talking about American oak, uh, although there's certainly Chardonnay brands out there, ZD. Um, I think Ron Bauer to some degree does a little bit of American oak on their Chardonnay. They'll impart different things, right? Like your, your barrels are going to impart all that, toastiness that richness um those baking spices that vanilla all that stuff that you're getting aromatically on the palate that is not like appley or pear that's barrel influence right um if you're talking about american oak more on like the coconut and dill side the other thing that i think we need to and of course you can have multiple different lengths of time and of course the the longer you would age your wine in that barrel the more it's going to pick up all of the things that Dan was just talking about. Um, the other thing that I, I want to mention, uh, and this is so interesting, is I served, I served Pierre Yves Colomare, which is known for uh, very, being very what we would call reductive, right? So I served it at Christmas Eve something last year uh, to a friend of mine, and she smelled it, and she was like, "This is so interesting. I've never smelled anything like this. I love it." And what she was smelling was this this reduction, right? This like you struck a match. It's a little bit sulfuric. Um, it has like, you know, sort of this like this interesting kind of smoky uh, nose to it. But reduction is one of these things in Chardonnay that, you know, some people love, some people hate. 
Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what that is so that if, you know, you at home are listening or watching, if you smell that in a wine, can you just, Dan, give me like a, a little explanation of like what it, what is that? Because that is neither oak nor malolactic fermentation, correct? That is correct. Um, reduction can come from the sulfuric, as you said, that max strike, that sulfuric character can come from uh, a late season sulfur spray because it rained in August mm. and you <laughs> are, you're, you're, you're nervous that you're going to get rot in some capacity. Um, so you want the, you want the, that to be on, um, to be part of like just to protect and preserve, but that some of that chemical can make its way into the finished wine. Mm. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of winemakers will add sulfur at the uh, press pan because maybe it did rain in August and you didn't spray, but you have some rot on your, um, on your grapes. And as you're pressing it off, that kind of, that rot, that decaying uh, microbial activity will come into your wine. You put sulfur in there as a preservative or a protectant. Uh, so you can, you can use sulfur. There was a big, um, uh, big conversation, which is another podcast about Premox uh, in white Burgundy. A lot of people were oh, prematurely oxidizing. So they were making their wines, making their Chablis, this kind of racy Chablis, more drinkable upon release so that they have a thing called the depletion, which means they, the restaurant or the wine shop sold the wine and someone drank it and they bought another one. Um, and I think that there was a whole period, it was like a 10-year period, like what was wrong with, with, with white burgundy, stay away from white burgundy. There was a whole Wikipedia site built for Primox. Um, with all, and then people were putting all the wines they had, and some people blame the cork, some people blame Robert Parker, some people blame um, styles of you know just uh, consumerism, and and so reduction, reductive winemaking is you know is preventing oxygen from from being part of the early stages of the uh, of the winemaking process, and then throughout the entire process, you can do that in stainless steel, you can do that in barrels where you don't show the wine a lot of oxygen and it kind of gets this darker gray, I always call reduction like this kind of gray tones of flavor. Um, and it just kind of brings it and draws it down. There is some, you know, flaws in wine, reductive flaws that never come out. Mm. A lot of reductive wines over time will release the oxygen. And if you can release it in the glass, even if it's drinking it over the course of the night, you'll see those kind of flinty notes dissipate because it's being exposed to oxygen. But sometimes there's a flaw that where that reduction turns into like really rotten cabbage. And, and then that's, that's, that's a completely different side of reduction, that, but that's more microbial and that's a flaw. Mm. So if you smell cabbage, something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> cabbage is never a good, a good note in wine. I've no. got away from that. Um, all right. Well, I think like those are, you know, some of the most uh, common pathways to Chardonnay. I think really what I want to do, we've got two different Chardonnays in front of us. Of course, we talked about the, the Grand Sonnery. And then we also have this uh, Jay Moreau Chablis Premier Cru from Montmartre. Yeah. Um, two very different styles. I think what I would like to do, just because we've talked about these different pathways, is uh, very quickly to go through both of these wines and sort of deduce maybe what pathway they took, especially for those who were at home. Let's start with the Chablis, right? So we've got this, this Jay Moreau Chablis. So when I smelled on the nose, you know, I, it's a lot of like that, like oyster shell, minerally, um, a little bit of like, a little bit of like richness that I smell, but not a lot in the way of like a toastiness. Uh, Dan, what would you deduce by, based on the nose, what happened with this wine? Uh, first and foremost, it's Premier Cru, which is, you know, the second highest level of uh, quality uh, designated to a vineyard in France. And knowing the vineyard side itself, um, I, I, I smelled a lot of the same characteristics. I had a little bit of that reductive flintiness that we were talking about as well. Um, when you have a Premier Cru vineyard, you don't have a lot of it, or a Grand Cru vineyard, you don't have a lot of it, so you protect it. Mm. You, it's very precious to the owners. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm an owner of my mind in uh, Chablis, I would be very precious with it. So you can tell that on the, on the palate, that they, they, they had a lot of TLC in the winemaking. Um, but then you can also see you know vintage related. So everything... You, you mentioned earlier style, you know, you'd make the choice of what your style is, but your style is, is dictated by the vineyard and then the vintage. The vintage, if you, you know the consistency of a growing region, what the vintage quality is like over time. But you, so you, you know your vineyard, you know your vintages as an average, and then your style is dictated by that. And this is just classic, you know, classic, slightly warm climate, low yielding vintage, um, Chablis and it's uh, it's done just 
really, really well. It's delicious. Yeah. I just don't want to, I'm very happy to enjoy this this afternoon. <laughs> Do we think uh, this went through malolactic fermentation and or had oak treatment on it? Yes, I'm both. Yes, I'm both. Vanessa? Well, I know what happened to yeah. this wine, but yes, yeah, Stan's right. This, yeah, it's a hundred, it's a hundred percent mallow um, on this wine. Thirty percent of it was moved during alcoholic fermentation out of stainless steel into barrel, and so it completed alcoholic fermentation in barrel, and then uh, you know back into stainless. Um, but I, I think one thing we haven't actually talked about is like there's a definite laziness to mm. this wine on the nose and the palate. So the, you know, wine sitting in contact with those like dead yeast cells. We talked about this man on our champagne episode, right. And like what, what it can impart. But for me on the nose, like that's almost the first thing that I notice. you get almost like, for me, it's like a cheesecloth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Note uh, yeah. as always kind of a marker for me for, for that. But, um, and I know this will happen to be for, I think it was 12 months. It's right around a year on, on the lees. And so I definitely get that on the wine and I get it texturally too, because I think that lees context, it gives this almost like silken palette feel, um, to it, which I get. And uh, again, like I agree with Dan, I think this, this shows a lot of TLC in the glass. I, I love this wine. Yeah, me too. And actually, you know, considering the, the, the premier crew status of this wine, great producer, you know, showing beautifully right now, I think this one is like 50 bucks on wine access. This is like, yes, a, I think like that very yeah. well-priced high quality Chablis. I'd be thrilled to serve. I also like, I think for people who don't love Chardonnay, um, this is a great sort of in between because even though it has gone through full mallow, even though it did, it was partially barrel fermented and aged in oak, uh, you know, you, it really doesn't show a lot of those qualities, you know, it doesn't show that, that no. ultra rich baking spice thing that a lot of people don't love. And I think the acidity on this wine is still ridiculous. I mean, it's super racy. Um, but in a way that feels a little rounder and softer, more approachable. So I, I always joke, my mom doesn't love wines that, that are super angular and, and racy and really high acid. And like, even though I feel it, I know that she won't, um, which I think is a really nice sort of in between uh, the grand sonnery. I, Vanessa, I obviously know that you collaborated on this wine. So, you know, mm -hmm. basically everything there is to know, uh, not that you don't know about most of the wines on wine access, <laughs> but um, I think even just looking at the color, you know, you see a little bit of a color differentiation. These are the same vintage. Of course, you know, color can be an age thing, but it can also come from oak. But there is sort of a, you know, more of a golden hue to this wine. So yeah. talk to me about like what this wine went through in terms of mallow and oak. And if there is anything that sort of stands out uh, to you as it compares to the Chablis. I mean, it's t right off the bat, you know, I think showing sight, it's much more, it's got that kind of new world, more fruit forward note to it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, immediately, um, even though Coombsville, as Dan was talking about earlier, is kind of a cooler site within Napa, it's still like distinctly more, more ripe than, than the Chablis. Um, this also went through, you know, hundred percent mallow. This was, you know, I think it was about 60% new French oak on this. Um, and I think it shows both of those, not in a way that uh, detracts from the wine, but if you want to kind of get, have a, like a sense memory of what that is, I get, I get the butteriness on this wine. I get the new French oak with the kind of like t vanilla clove, like sweet spices. Mm -hmm. And then also with the texture, right? It has like a breadth of texture um, from that time, that time in oak. But I'm, I'm like, Dan, as a winemaker, like, what do you? I actually, I think that it would be a disservice to this wine to kind of classify it as a classic California Pottery Chardonnay because totally. it's not. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is much more length to this and complexity and and as I said earlier when I was drinking it, uh, energy on mm -hmm. the palate. I um and I think that's part you know part uh, choice of where this is coming from in Napa Valley, um and the decisions that Luke made as he was uh, as he was thinking about the the kind of the cooler, Coombsville hillside area that these uh, grapes were grown. Um, mm -hmm. but it does have a lot of that kind of immediate familiarity of California. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all the things you named, you know, barrel ferment, new French oak, toastiness, all yeah. that stuff lives there, but doesn't live there in a way where we, people coined anything but Chardonnay, the ABC club um, <laughs> years ago, because this, this is not one of those wines. No, no, okay. I, I love this wine. And I, I, I will say I'm a sucker for like a rich, unctuous Chardonnay. As much as I'm a, a fan of very racy, lean, bright, I think both styles are very legitimate. I enjoy them both for different reasons. But I, I have to say that I, I really love this wine. Like I, I mean, not this was in the wine club so that we knew that I would like it. But even yes. just tasting it now, I'm like, this is even next to the Chablis, the Premier Cru Chablis. I'm like, this is, 
I keep going back to this wine. It does have a really nice freshness to it, you know, um, that yeah. balance of that the California sunshine, but my mouth is like really watering with this wine yeah. um, because of, yeah, great acidity. Well, we've got a few questions from the audience that I want to wrap up with. Uh, the first one, this is a, a challenging question, I think, for all three of us, which is how do you tell what style a Chardonnay a wine is just by looking at the bottle? Any clues or things that you would suggest looking for if you're turning that bottle around or just looking at the front of it? Chardonnay is um, a grape style, a grape and a style of wine made that you have to do a little research in advance, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, or you might you might take a, a wrong turn. So Yeah. And of course, if it says in the back that it's been aged in New French Oak for a period of 24 months, I think, you know, pretty good indication that it's going to be an oaky or Chardonnay. Of course, if it yeah. says went through Mallow, those are, you know, the things that, that we talked about that if they're, if they are on the label, which they sometimes are, not often are, those are things that you can take away. Vanessa, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say just let's say specifically, because I agree with you, it's like place can tell you a lot about it if they do go to the trouble of telling you what, you know, what happened in the winemaking. But for instance, in something like Chablis, you know, it's, and you look at the quality level. So is it like, is it basic Chablis? Is it, is it Premier Cru? Is it Grand Cru? You know, the amount of new oak that they would use would go up in terms of quality level. So just by looking at, at that, you might have a bit of an indication as to what's in the, in the bottle. Next question. When it comes to winemaking, what's the difference between a $20 bottle of Chardonnay versus a $200 bottle? We kind of touched on this a little bit with our, with my economics question, but uh, Dan, maybe you want to weigh into this a little. Um, I think Vanessa also mentioned the amount of oak that is going to be used in something like uh, a, a village level white burgundy is going to be maybe 40, 50, 60 dollars. A premier crew will be 50, 60, 70 dollars. A grand crew will be 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars. Just using examples, not necessarily actual mm-hmm. dollars, but you'll, ha- you'll see that. Um, so um, I think scarcity is, uh, is, mm-hmm. is definitely part of it. Supply and, supply and demand is going to be a big part of that. Wine making. Amanda, you mentioned earlier about Kendall Jackson and spending and having the scale to have the money to do the to make a fourteen dollar vintage reserve in barrel. That is um, that's rare. A lot of other fourteen dollar bottles of Chardonnay would probably be made in stainless steel, and you can and it's a volume. You know, for for the audience to know, a, a tra- tra- traditional barrique is sixty gallons. A stainless steel tank could be anything from sixty gallons to six hundred gallons to six thousand gallons. So you can understand the economies of scale there. So, um, but stylistically, I think is what the consumer for question is probably going towards. It's probably going to be not much of a difference. I think the twenty dollars wine wants to be the two hundred present itself <laughs> as a two hundred dollars bottle of wine. Yeah. So I think in a blind tasting, side by side, you would have a hard time identifying unless you're really cluing in on the refinement and the precision and that TLC that we talked about in the Chablis. I wanted to kind of tack on to something Dan was saying too uh, about like the $20 bottle is probably trying to taste like the, like the $200 (laughs) bottle. Um, And, but I think, you know, something um, as wines sit in the glass, particularly as they warm up, they kind of start to show you what they, you know, what, what they really are. And I'm not knocking $20 bottles. Like we sell a lot of $20 bottles of wine. I absolutely love and I buy and I drink myself, but I think like, let's say for instance, in a, um, if there was like a flight of Chardonnays on the tasting exam, if I thought there was potentially burgundy or like in this flight, I would like, wait, I would put them aside and let everything warm up because sometimes those ones that are made to like taste more expensive, like they'll show better right away. Right. They show yeah kind of flashier and more forward and you're like oh this is the high quality one but if you kind of sit back and wait and let them all kind of warm up often the wines from the classic regions will come to you but they make you wait for it i think that's a great point um they can be a little bit more subtle and nuanced uh on the higher end for sure they're to your i think that's a an excellent well-stated point um that i actually feel like i've never fully fleshed out before but yeah i will i will it, it's, it's similar like obvious, and not, it's like an obvious thing but like i just never yeah and not to go down a rabbit hole but like you know we did a whole episode on champagne but we already have so i'm just gonna keep digging um but it's the same thing i think a lot of times with like multi-vintage champagne versus vintage whereas right off right. the bat the multi-vintage shows better right because it's yes. meant to be enjoyed yes. earlier and the vintage will seem like oh it's kind of lean it's not that expressive whatever but like you let it let it warm up in the glass or like yeah. You know, breathe for a second and then it, it shows you what it is. This is why blind tastings are a little <laughs> challenging sometimes, right? Even for consumers, right? Like yeah. I you know, I I love seeing these like YouTube videos of like 
we tasted three people and they didn't know the difference between a $300 bottle and a $30 bottle of wine. And there's like, there's so many things involved with that video that like I can't can't even dive into, but that's a great point. Like they don't always show the best right away. Like it's a, this is a, this is a long-term thing that we're here for. Last question is how do I know if my Chardonnay will age? I mean, obviously like better quality Chardonnays will have the potential to age. Uh, what's your sweet spot for a Chardonnay with age? What do you like? From my own personal perspective of making Chardonnay, it's always about its early and easy drinkability. Mm. I like it to be a little bit racy and, and upfront, but I tend, I put 100% New French Oak on my Chardonnay to give it <clears throat> early entry to the palate, the softness and oiliness, and then the, the, the raciness cleans it up. But um, five, seven years, I think is for me, I think five to seven is like my sweet spot mm. on all wine, um, except Masakana. I think three. All to white five. wine or um, all wine? All wine. I mean, all wine. Ital- five Wait, to seven. I feel like you've drank like so many old Italians. I I love old Italians. They're my favorite people. They're my favorite wines. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> they, <laughs> the um, I actually am on such a bender on on young Nebbiolo because I think climate change has played such a wow. such a game changing style everyone has been moving back to the classically boti driven uh, big old traditional ways of making uh, nebbiolo but climate change is bringing riper grapes to the, to mm. the party and because of that i think the wines are so much more expressive mm. in their youth but they're treated so much more traditionally and roberto conterno at, at you know giacomo conterno is the number one example of this so i like I'm, i think five to seven my mind is blown right now five to seven years across the board i'm gonna use that yeah. from now on when people are like how long should age my mind I'd be like dan pachowski says five to seven years that's <laughs> five to seven most he's willing to go <laughs> and then and then, it, then it's your choice then it's your choice of decanting yeah. and aeration and setting it aside and yeah you know opening you you know, I might open that uh, five-year-old Nebbiolo at like 8 a.m. in the morning, just pull the cork on it, put the cork back in, stamp it up in your, you know, in your, in, in your, in a cool spot yeah, in your house or your wine, your wine refrigerator. Yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to Chardonnay, like five to seven years is a, a good sweet spot. I've certainly had very old Chardonnays that have been delicious, but I think you're going to be more disappointed than pleased when it comes to like super old Chardonnay. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will have an issue with me saying that but i i will say like you know no, having... amanda amanda you you've tasted the most old stony hill out of, out of anyone really i mean you working at the restaurant True. you did at press you tasted a lot of those bottles so you know but that's why i say that because i think i've been exactly i think i've been exactly. burned I agree. well and i will you know there there are producers I that i've had that I, you know are are good more across the board right like my comments is a great example yeah of great Chardonnay that when aged for 20 plus years still does really well. Stony Hill to me has never been that producer, you know, and I, I don't mean that's no shade to Stony Hill. It's just, they, they're so delicious young and they're so delicious with five to seven years. I've never had like an, an amazing moment with this. So an old, old Stony Hill Chardonnay. Um, and some people have, but I, I do think there's an element of like a personal preference in that question always as mm-hmm. Vanessa and I have talked ad nauseum about, um, I just want to add one thing because you guys started the podcast saying this and you came to Napa Valley to learn more, to have access, um, to understand more about wine. And since this is a, a podcast about kind of digging in deeper about questions and, and commentary about how wine is made, especially Chardonnay, I, uh, Vanessa, you brought up the concept of lees. Yes. I don't think, I don't think a lot of people understand what that is. Um, but it is, uh, it is the, as you said, the dead yeast cells that uh, through batonage and through osmosis of living in the barrel, mm-hmm. uh, aging wine together, it adds a lot of complexity and nuance. Um, there are two things I want to do when I rack my hide Chardonnay in, uh, February for bottling, I want to capture some of those leaves so you can taste them. Mm. Mm. The, the reason for that is I, I true, I truly believe that, you know, from my, counterparts in Napa Valley and Sonoma County, I don't think we work the lees as mm. well as the French do. Mm. The French always are tasting the lees, constantly, constantly, constantly tasting the lees. They're trying to understand how much lees are important to their winemaking style, to the finished wine, to the ageability of the wine, to the nuance and complexity. I don't think we do that enough. I don't know anyone in my French set who talks about that. Mm. Second, at the end of the French harvest every year, there's a thing, um, a very rustic rural thing in, uh, in, in Burgundy called fondue vigneron. And what fondue vigneron is, they take the lees 
when they rack out of the stainless steel and bring it to barrel and to go through malic fermentation, they take the leaves, they put it in a crock pot, and they wow. use the, the leaves as um, to, to boil instead of cheeses, they do it, they do meats. So you're you're what? bubbling, simmering leaves, and you put thin slices of meat into the into the the Chardonnay leaves, and then you eat that on on toasted bread and with some butter, and like that's like it's called fondue vigneron. It's a, it's huh. a celebratory thing at the end of every French uh, harvest in some households, not all households. Um, I, I learned that through Stéphane Vivier, from uh, who was born and raised in Dijon, and and, uh, and worked in Burgundy, and obviously worked here at, in California as a, probably one of the best Chardonnay wine makers. Um, in, in the region. I love so, Stefan Vivier. But we, yes. So we did. We did a lot of fondue vigneron after harvests uh, in the in the last. Well, the last give us a call weeks. next time. We'll do a we'll do a yeah. like you know impromptu podcast or something or not. We'll so. just eat and not include any of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been a lot of fun. Very informative. I feel like I learned a lot today. I drank some great oh, wine. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, you guys did too. And if that was the case, I encourage you once again to like, subscribe, review this podcast. Uh, send a little message to Dan Petrosky, who you can find at Massacan on Instagram. Uh, you can, of course, find his wines when they are available, even though they sell out all the time on Wine Access or on his yeah. website. Um, very difficult wines to get anymore, but I don't know. Maybe we'll have to encourage you to ramp up production. If you're not a member of the Wine Access Unfiltered Wine Club, please uh, consider joining us. It's a, it's a really fun wine club. And of course, you get to listen and drink and watch with us as uh as you consume all this wonderful content so thank you so much dan it was great to see you virtually even though like you're down the street from me normally so if this is the way that we need to catch up by all means vanessa as always thank you this is the wine access unfiltered podcast produced by chappie cottrell and we are your host vanessa conlon and amanda mccrossin thank you for listening and see you next time bye